Welcome back. Part 3 of Musculoskeletal Disorders in Children. This lecture video addresses hip dysplasia, also known as developmental dysplasia of the hip or congenital hip dysplasia. In this disorder, the hip joint, which is mainly cartilage, becomes displaced. The head of the femur is supposed to be situated right into the acetabulum in order for the hip to develop normally. However, when we have developmental dysplasia of the hip, there's a laxity in the joint, and it allows the hip to either sublux, which means to partially move out of its joint space, or completely dislocate out of the joint space. We don't really know why it happens. Is it a genetic disorder? Because there is some history of it in the family. Is it something that happened prenatally in the, their development? Or did it have something to do with postnatal positioning? And one of the reasons why we are not wrapping babies very tight right now is because the current thought is we are encouraging developmental dysplasia of the hip. So you need to know the different distinctions in this hip dysplasia. Dislocated means that the head of the femur is completely out of the socket. And what we would see clinically is the legs are a different length. When you look at the thigh folds, they are asymmetric. And it's not common to see this right at birth. This is usually something that we're going to see if we missed it in the newborn exam and the child continues to grow. And during a normal pediatric visit, all of a sudden we're starting to see this disorder. Dislocatable means that the hip is resting in the socket, but by doing the Barlow maneuver, we can actually push it completely out. I have a really nice YouTube video on the difference between the Barlow and the Ortolani maneuver because you need to know both of them. You need to know them for peds and you need to know them for OB. When a hip is dislocatable, clinically we are not going to see a difference in the leg length and we're not going to see asymmetry of the th thigh folds. Subluxatable means that the hip is loose. It can move out some, but not completely. And in most cases, this is what a child has, is a subluxatable hip. Clinically, we see nothing. All we feel is a click and a little bit of mobility. So look at this child. What do you notice that's different between her two legs? His. Oh, excuse me, that is not a girl. Okay, well, first of all, I can tell you this baby was born breech. And how do I know? Because those legs go straight up in the air. So this kid has been sitting in utero in this position for a long time. But when you look closely, you can see that this child's right leg goes all the way up. So in yoga, we call this the happy baby pose. But look at that left leg. You see how that left leg goes out to the side? That's because the hip is not in its socket, and so they're not able to bring that leg straight up. Here's another picture of a hip that is displaced out of the socket. You see how that femur is so far away from the pelvic bones? And this shows you a baby who has asymmetric folds on the buttocks as well as the thighs, anteriorly and posteriorly. You see how the buttock droops a little bit on the left side and on the right side it's up and there's an extra skin fold on that right side. And then the right side of the picture shows limited abduction of the hip. So we can't get it to go all the way down like the other side. And then when we put these legs together and we're pushing them up towards the baby's belly, the femur is shorter on this child's right side than on the left. This is an older child, so we missed it. And so as this child grows, we're seeing more of the unequal folds of the skin and the ability to abduct is greatly reduced. And you can see the abnormal height of the knees where one is shorter than the other. We have two exams that we do 
the Ortolani is on the left side and the Barlow is on the right side. So on the Ortolani, we're going to flex the hip and knees, we're going to abduct them and end up lifting the thighs outward. And you're going to use your last three fingers of both hands to feel for a clunk, which would indicate movement out of the socket. The Barlow's, you're going to adduct the legs and apply downward pressure at the same time. And this assesses for the complete dislocation. So one is going to just go boop down and you're going to feel it. Once again, you're going to use those last three fingers of your hand to be able to feel over that joint. If we miss this disorder in the newborn exam or in early well child visits, it can lead to a permanent disability where this person ends up having one leg shorter than the other. This impacts the hip in general and it also impacts the low back. So there's going to be early development of osteoarthritis and a lot of hip pain and back pain. If the hip is dislocated, we can actually see limited abduction by the time this child is four to five months of age. We'll also see the leg length discrepancy. If we completely miss it, what we're going to see now is when the child is walking and running, they're limping. They have a very stiff hip when we're trying to abduct it. And for these children, an x-ray is going to tell us far more than either the oral Ortolani or the Barlow because those are really meant for young, young children. So how do we treat this disorder? In the little ones, we use what we call a pavlic harness. And what it does is it abducts the legs 70 degrees and it keeps the head of the femur in the acetabulum. It's most successful if we can implement this before two months of age. So if we don't find it at the newborn exam when the child's in the nursery, they're going to be seen at two weeks, they're going to check again, and then we're going to see them again for the two-month check. Anywhere on those exams, if we feel an abnormality, we're going to begin this pavlic harness. They will wear this for up to six months, and they wear it all day, every day. The only time they take this off is to have a bath. And you can see on the bottom picture, it's very easy to get this on, and it's all Velcroed together. You do have to worry about skin breakdown, and that's going to be part of your education to the family. You need to teach the family about positioning the baby this way, but still putting them in a car seat. And last but not least, they must be compliant. If they're not compliant with this, oh, I'm so embarrassed, my kid needs to have this, or I don't want her to wear it, or I don't want him to wear it, then we're looking at surgical correction down the line. So if they're over six months of age, we're going to put them in a hip spike cast. This involves casting all the way across the abdomen, around the back, down the hip, the legs are in abduction, once again, at least 70 degrees, and then these casts go all the way down to their ankles. These kids are very, very heavy to carry around. I'd much rather have a kid in a pavlic harness than have to take care of them in a spike of cast. When these kids come back from the OR, be very careful in your assessment of all the edges on this cast because they still have to lay on it while it's drying. And so we can do what we call pedaling the cast, where we will take tape and we will go on the inside of the cast to the outside, inside to the outside, so that any sharp edges are completely covered, because otherwise it's going to cut this baby's skin. And if that happens, they go back to the OR, cast is cut off, and we start all over again. You see where the, the only opening is going to be at the genitalia so that this child can use the bathroom. When you diaper these kids, use two diapers. You're going to take one that's larger than what the kid needs and you're going to tuck it neatly inside the cast. Fold it a little bit so that anything that gets soiled is not going to go up the kid's back. I've had a kid where he had diarrhea, he pooped, pooped all the way up his cast we had to send them back to the OR just because we couldn't clean it.
We don't want that to happen. So you're going to double diaper them and then hopefully you're going to check their diaper frequently enough that you can take that diaper off that's soiled and the other diaper is still going to be clean. We need to watch for skin breakdown. We have bowel and bladder issues. Be careful what you feed the kids. Don't tell the parents, do not give them anything that's going to cause diarrhea. Keep them away from other people who have diarrhea type illnesses. And then provides distractions for the child because they are going to be immobilized for a long time. You can see this picture of the child that's on the upper left that this is an older child. So they're old enough to be fearful of what happened to them. They're not comfortable. They're very bored. Their toileting is going to be at the wayside because they're not going to really be able to get up and use a bathroom. Some are very reluctant to use a bedpan, but they can, you can put them on the bedpan, you know, that fracture type pan. Um, but we're going to put diapers on them just in case. The family needs support because they're going to be tired. They have to do everything for this child. It's hard to transport the child. They're very heavy. They may need two people just to move this child from chair to bed to wagon to buggy to the car. And this ends the presentation on congenital hip dysplasia. Mm -hmm.